Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. Welcome to Digital Domination Super Summit. This is where some of the smartest minds in tech share lessons and actionable tips to improve your business and my business. I'm taking notes along the way. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with successful entrepreneurs and leaders. Today we have Rob Walling. Lessons learned as a serial entrepreneur of 13 years. Rob, thanks for joining us. I'm going to introduce you and tell a little background. How are you doing? I'm doing great. It's good to be here. It's great to see you. And um, so Rob has a lot of great things in store. He's going to be presenting Lesson Learned as a Serial Entrepreneur. Just a little bit about Rob. Um, he operates a number of software products, including hittail.com, getdrip.com, .net invoice.com. His blog is Software by Rob and is followed by over 25,000 web entrepreneurs. Um, he also has a startup podcast. He's founded MicroConf, which is a conference for self-funded startups, and he's also author of the Start Small, Stay Small. So much and so little time. Rob, I'll let it, uh, you take over from here. Very good. Well, yeah, thanks again for having me, Jeremy. It's uh, truly a pleasure to be here. Let me just get my screen shared. All right. Okay. How am I looking? Can you see a big white screen? Yes, you're, you're good right. to go. Very good. So, uh, yeah, thanks everybody for having me. It's it's a pleasure to be here. I hope to make really good use of your time. I know that you know all of our time is valuable, and so um, I'm going to be cutting through some stuff pretty quick. My uh, title of, of what I'm talking about today is Lessons I've Learned as a Serial Entrepreneur. And as Jeremy said, I've been doing this for about 13 years. Uh, it took me about six or seven to get to the point where I could basically quit quit my gig, you know, quit my consulting job. I mean, that was really my goal, and truly, that was the day that I felt like I was successful. Um, that was my that was my measure of success, was being able to support myself um, and, and not have to rely on consulting gigs and, and salary uh, salary gigs. Um, I'm at Rob Walling on Twitter. Would love to hear from you. I won't be able to reply while I'm presenting, but uh, if you have questions, comments, hashtags, anything, just please connect with me there. And um, Let's dive in. I like to start my talks with uh, what's in it for you, the listener, because you are basically giving me your attention for the next, it's probably going to be about 30 minutes of discussion. There'll be some uh, questions interjected in there and certainly some questions afterwards. But I want to give you an outline of, of the things that I hope that you can take away from this talk that you can basically put into action this week, next week, in the coming months. Because if you don't take that away, you're you're bombarded with so much information constantly on, you know, whether it's hacker news, podcasts, blogs, audiobooks, that unless you're taking something away from it, I believe that it's a waste of time. And so I always want to know what's in it for me when I'm starting a talk. And so I want to give that to you plain and simple. First thing I'm going to talk about is the value of being realistic, especially as a self-funded startup founder. Um, I made several missteps along the way, and I'm going to point those out and talk how you can apply those to your, your experience. Um, also talk about how to maximize your learning speed. If you raise a big bucket of funding, you can move really fast because you can hire people, you can make big mistakes, you can make expensive mistakes and throw money at things just to move faster. When you're self-funded, you have to, you're almost forced to move slower and that becomes an issue because unless you want to take 10 years to get to the point where you can quit your job, you have to learn how to learn quickly, how to fail quickly, and basically how to maximize that speed. So I'm going to talk about how, how I've done that and hopefully how you can apply it. I'm going to talk about how to parlay your skills, meaning how to start small and then move your way up, how to gain just a few skills here and there and uh, build them into bigger and larger ideas so that you're not trying to, to boil the ocean from the start and compete with Facebook as a self-funded founder. Maybe you start in a tiny niche and then, and then move your way up. Fourth thing I'm going to talk about is how to, how to validate a startup idea. Uh, I've done this just recently with my newest startup, Get Drip, and uh, it worked, it's worked out quite well for me. And then how to juggle many priorities. I have a lot going on, obviously, um, and I, you know, until about a year ago, it was just me with a few contractors. Um, now I have a full-time employee, but it's really a tiny, tiny team here, and I'm able to juggle these things that I want to talk about, uh, things I've learned and how to optimize that process. Yeah. And outside of that, Rob, I just want to mention, um, besides that part, you have a family and kids too, so you're juggling that aspect also. <clears throat> that's correct. Yeah, and that's, I find that a lot of folks who have families and kids still feel like they want to go the venture-funded route, and I would almost encourage people not to. I think there's a better road for you. 
And then the last point is I, I hope to provide some inspiration. Um, I think there's room for inspiration. It's probably about 10% of, of what I give. I like to give 90% actionable. Um, but the inspiration is that you know, I started off as just a, a lowly software developer 13, 14 years ago. And um, you know, within five or six years, I was able to kind of build my own empire and, and grow it from there. So hopefully you can uh, be inspired by my story. And the uh, you know Jeremy helped me put together the slides, and I really liked his title for this one: "Overnight Success in Just Under a Decade." The idea here that I used uh, Jeremy used a specially small font, and I like that it shows how many steps you have to go through. Almost everyone you see today, whose name you know, who's a big founder, you know, you can say Patrick McKenzie, uh, Heat and Shaw. Uh, Peldy, Jason Cohen, pretty much anyone, Darmesh, anyone you name, they have gone through a number of steps that probably took a decade or more, and that part is often left out of the Inc. magazine, the, the tech crunch, the mashable write-up, and so we put pressure on ourselves as founders to, to somehow get there quickly and get there instantly, not realizing that it's actually a long road to get there. So. Um, Here's my timeline, and I'll, I'm only going to take two or three minutes to go through this, but I want to give you an idea of the steps that it took. So in 1982, I was eight years old, and I wrote my first line of code. It was basic. It was on an Apple IIe that my parents got me. In 1998, I graduated from college with a computer engineering degree, and I went to work in construction for some reason. <laughs> During this construction time, my dad worked in construction, and I was working with him, um, but I didn't, I didn't like it, and so I started a tech company. Uh, what I thought at the time was going to just rule the world. It was called SmartGuy.net. It was an ISP reseller, and it was a failure for many reasons. I didn't go after a market. I didn't know what I was doing, um, and I, I killed a lot of time on it. So in 2000, I leave construction, and I start working for a consulting firm, and this is where I started realizing that working for anyone else is a hamster wheel, and I wanted to build my own flywheels. And flywheels are things like books, information, and software that you can write once and uh, you know use over and over and sell to many people. So at this point, I start having this realization. And in 2002, just a couple years later, uh, my wife goes to Africa for six weeks on a, a trip, a volunteer trip, and I coded about eight hours a night for six weeks, and I created Feedshot.com, which um, still exists today. Uh, I don't own it anymore, but um, it, yeah, it was a failure. It was six weeks plus then another couple months of marketing. It wound up making about $100 a month, and I certainly had higher hopes for it than that. In 2003, not wanting to um, uh, repeat the same the same failure of spending all this time coding it, I actually acquired an app. It was a forum software called ChitChat.net, and I wound up buying it from a guy for $150. And it was a failure, but I learned a lot from it. And it, it got up to about $300 a month. And so by this time, I'm making a car payment from these two apps. These are tiny little ideas that are taking time. And all this time, I'm learning. And I'm learning SEO and AdWords and paid acquisition. You know, these little little channels, one at a time. Then I Rob, a I want to uh, just interject for a second. And uh -huh. what I love about you is you're so open. And you know, people just want to talk about their successes. And you like talking about some of the mistakes and failures along the way. Yep. And what what I want people to notice when you go through this is, you don't just, okay, this is a failure, but you took that step, whatever that step was, you learned and brought it to the next one. So like you were talking about, I spent so much time creating this app, and you thought, well, okay, that was a mistake. Why don't I just find something out there that's good and then market it? So I just want people to kind of follow that you had that take-home point for each of those, you know, quote-unquote, learning experiences or failures. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. And so in, in 2004, I... Um, went back for some I couldn't find anything to acquire and I wound up wanting to jump on the bandwagon again jump on the ink magazine you know sexy startup bandwagon and since dig was big I tried to start a personal finance a niched dig site wasted a ton of time probably 6 months of nights and weekends launched flogs.com to basically nothing I mean it was it was 10 to 10 20 bucks a month in revenue and I learned not to try to build a a community site as a as a serial or a self-funded entrepreneur my first thing that I would consider was a success was in 2005, I acquired an app called .NET Invoice. It was an alpha. It had a bunch of bugs in it. It had a couple hundred dollars in pre-orders, and I eventually grew that, grew that to about $2,000 a month. Um, that was my, the first time where I said, oh, this could actually work. 
And around this time, I started my blog and I started writing about software development, not about entrepreneurship. So I got sucked back into uh, the whole the rigmarole in 2007. I was living in New Haven, Connecticut. I connected with a couple of Yale MBAs, and we applied to Y Combinator. I'll talk a little more about that later. Um, that was wound up being a waste of time. I learned. A, I, I think what I learned from that is that self-funded is probably a better way to go for someone like me. Then I went on. I bought more, and the, you see, bought, bought, acquired, acquired. Um, the idea here is that my time, I was consulting, I was making $100, $125 an hour, I was booked full time, and I had way more money than I had time. So this is where I started using that to an advantage, and I bought apps from other people who didn't know how to market them. And by this time, I had built just enough marketing skill that I was parlaying that from one app to the next. And you can see that in 2008, oops, I skipped over it, but... I pivoted the blog to start talking about entrepreneurship because I felt like I had enough knowledge at that point. And that's the day. That was the day that I achieved success, in my opinion. I stopped consulting. Kept acquiring apps. Published my book a uh, couple years after I stopped consulting. And then, you know, another year later, I put together a conference in Vegas. And at this point, I realized I wanted to do an even bigger idea because all my apps were doing maybe between one and 5,000 a month at this point. And I wanted to do something bigger, like a 5X or a 10X on that. And so I sent a cold email to the owner of hittail.com, and I later acquired that. And in 2012, I basically 10X'd a little more uh, 10X'd Hittail. And then 2012, started building Get Drip. And I launched that just a few months ago, about 90 days ago, and I hit $7,000 in recurring revenue in the first month. Congrats. Thank That's you. Great. Very excited about that. And so this is my, this is my story. Um, I'm going to touch on some key points, some successes and failures from this over the next you know, 20 minutes that I have remaining. Um, so let's, let's dive in. So something I touched on, I think the first lesson, that I want to point out, and uh, I have five, five lessons or six lessons. The first one I want to point out is to be realistic. And this is something I learned early on when I dove back into the kind of the Y Combinator world. Um, I was married with a child. My wife was in grad school. She was an intern working 60 hours a week. I was consulting 40 hours a week plus, and Yet I had this idea that somehow I could apply to Y Combinator, which was two and a half hours away from me in New Haven, and if I got in, I could just make it work. And that's what I kept saying is, well, I see other people making this work, but you know, as a, as a, in my early to mid-30s, with all this other stuff going on, I had a completely unrealistic view of what I could actually accomplish. And that's something that... that I think sent me on the wrong path for many years. It was probably three or four years in there that I wasted trying to go after these big ideas because I wasn't living in a startup hub. I wasn't in my 20s. I was married. I had all this stuff going on that I these these this this bottom line that I had to hit with consulting dollars that I couldn't just walk away from it and and go start a startup. If you're in that situation, that is awesome, and you should totally move to San Francisco, Boston, Seattle. Uh, Manhattan, you know, there, there are these startup hubs where you can do this. But if you're not there, and if you can't just pick up and move, and if you can't basically, you know, quit consulting, you know, cold and and make half the money and, and with hopes that you'll someday be making millions from your startup, then you, you have to take a more realistic view, I believe. And this is the plight and the situation of most people who I talk to. I actually found out, find out most people are more, they're better cut out for self-funded stuff than they are for raising venture capital. And so the lesson I learned is to be realistic. And this, uh, this screenshot here is a piece of my PayPal balance that year. And the reason it's so high is because that during this year that I worked at trying to get into Y Combinator and trying to get some angel funding, I let .NET Invoice kind of go on autopilot. And this is 2007. And at the end of the year, I kind of put my head up from all this nonsense of these start, you know, these failed ideas that never did anything. And I had $25,000 in the bank from .NET Invoice. And I realized all this dreaming and these meetings and this talking about stuff but never actually doing anything because we were all just trying to get someone's permission to launch our startup. We were looking for their permission to give us money so we could do something. That that was probably wasted time. And that this thing that was actually making real money, that if I could duplicate this just a couple more times, that I could feasibly get to my goal of quitting consulting. Mm. I want to ask about that um, yep. because with with Y Combinator and and with anyone, you know, we want that big idea, you mm -hmm. know. And at what point did you realize, okay, I need to shift, and it's not realistic 
because you're going through this process. Obviously, you thought it was a good idea, you know. Yep. And oftentimes, we go down that path and we think it's a good idea. At what point did you actually realize, okay, I really need to focus on this other stuff. This isn't going to work for me. Well, I mean, the point was, frankly, at the end of that year, and I looked back and said, wow, I haven't killed a year on any single project um, ever. And I, did, you know, it was, a, it was a year of nights and weekends, but it, it was a lot of time. And I look back and just evaluated. We were moving at that, that point from New Haven to Boston for other reasons. And I realized I have to change something because I can't do this forever. I turned 33, maybe, 33, 34 that year. And I looked down the line and said, at what point is this going to work? Because I can't, I don't want to be 43 looking back and still striving for the big dream, you know, striving for that the permission. And to, to be able to look at the bank balance, at the PayPal balance, and have that concrete affirmation of, of just going after a niche and that that could actually work, um, that's when I knew, I'll say I knew it. I, I didn't know it for 100% for sure, you know, but I... I had an inkling and I wanted to explore it, if nothing else. Yeah, because oftentimes the things right in front of us, yeah. it, it's not exciting. It's not mm -hmm. sexy. So we move to something else that is and that other stuff could be working. Mm -hmm. And that's what I like about your message is start small, stay small. You know, you want to really focus on that niche and then, you know, grow up from there. Right, and it's much less interesting than the stuff we see on TechCrunch and Fast Company and what the, the tech press talks about. They will, they will never talk about these niche apps, but this is what you have to do if you want to be successful as a self-funded startup. Mm -hmm. Were there All other right. challenges for that one? And the other thing is, you know, you're working with yourself, mm -hmm. and these other ones you are incorporating other... Founders, yeah. how did yeah. that play in the, into effect? It was it was definitely different. Um, the founders that I was incorporating, I liked them a lot, and I think things could have worked out. Like they were good people. We didn't have any founder issues or equity issues or any discussions like that. But it did mean that everything was kind of by committee, and things moved slower. And it was always waiting, they were either waiting on me to do research or I was waiting on them to talk to the angel that they knew or there was just a lot of waiting and I find that when I do things on my own there's no one else to pass the buck to and there's no, there is no waiting because it's just you charging ahead trying to get things done. So I, know, I am a founder of single founder, I'm uh, sorry, I'm a, a fan of single founders. Um, I think if you have a founder, that's that's great if you have someone that you can work with. But it's like a marriage, and so you need to think long and hard about it, and not you know you wouldn't jump into a marriage if you didn't really know someone that well. Yeah. So that's a good point to bring up. Um, I am I am slightly biased towards single founders, and maybe that's just a reaction to the VC world being biased towards uh, you know group founders. All right. So second lesson that I've learned along the way is to uh, let me let me not go there. It's to learn faster. Um, I think as you saw with with my my history, you know, when I went through the that first slide, I realized that as a self-funded founder, I unfortunately am forced to move slower than than funded startups. And actually, these days, now that I do have um, a lot of apps working for me, I have more experience, and I do have some money that I can play with. I can move way faster than I could five years ago. And so. Uh, in the interest of not taking a decade or two to get to the point where you can quit your job, the what I learned is to try to learn faster. And the way that I did that was by starting to acquire apps. And so instead of even though I'm a software developer and I love building, I love creating. Like that's what I that's why I do this. Um, I started buying applications from other people. And I know if you're a developer in the audience, you're probably cringing at this, but what is your goal? Is your goal to, to sit and toil with code and to have fun building a greenfield app? Then you should go do that, but you should probably think about doing an open source project or you should think about doing some hobby projects. If your goal truly is to get to the point where you know, you're know you quitting your job, and I'll say that you know in the United States, the typical goal I hear is it's 10 grand a month. 10 grand a month gets you 120K a year and that'll allow you to live in most most areas of the United States and have a wife and a kid and pay for health insurance. And so if you want to get there, it's going to take you a really long time if you have to build everything yourself. And so some of the apps that I acquired included a, a niche job board called Apprentice Lyman Jobs, uh, an e-commerce site called Just Beach Towels. It sold beach towels on a dropship model. CMS Themer, which is basically a theming service for WordPress and Drupal. And it was a productized service that I outsourced all the back end. And some of these I only owned for 
six months or a year as my stepping stone just to get me to the point of you know of hitting that um, my number was eight I'm pretty sure it was 8k 8, 8,000 a month back in 2007 or 8 when I needed to quit my job and I acquired wedding toolbox which is a niche wedding website builder and dotnet invoice as we've talked about and then uh, then hit tail as well um, that's just a screenshot of dotnet invoice and I think the the last thing I'll touch on is don't don't worry about it's like don't be scared of making mistakes like I learned from both successes and failures and I believe that you need to have a lot of failures along the way and then hit that one success in order to realize how valuable it is um, yeah I think that's which, it Jeremy which of those points um, did you feel it was like a really turning point you know when you was it when you first purchased apprentice lineman jobs just beach towels and also the other question is so where do you even if someone's like well, where do I even find an you know application mm -hmm. yeah yep um, the turning point for me was when was when I bought dot .net invoice it was doing a couple hundred it wasn't even a month it was just like pre-orders of a few hundred bucks and I got it out the door and I tripled the price and it got to 900 and it started doing $900 a month recurring and then I built it up and when it hit two grand I was like oh this is really interesting like that that made me like wow this is a house payment and I'm not really war I'm not writing code to make this house payment you know I was doing a little bit of marketing but a lot of it was flywheel stuff SEO and AdWords and it was kind of minimal maintenance that was a shocker for me. The other turning point, as I said, was when I was able to quit consulting, and that was when I hit about seven, seven-ish, eight grand a month, and that was, I think, right before or after uh, acquiring apprentice lineman jobs. Um, I guess go through maybe the, the biggest question is where'd you find them, and also when you <laughs> see a property, obviously you want something that's not you you think you can maximize and yeah, you can do, right. you can improve. So what were some of the things that you saw? Not only where'd you find them, but what did you see that you could improve? Yep, good good questions. So three things, one um, or three places to find them. This is where I found them. Actually, it's probably four now. The .NET invoice I found on forums. It was SitePoint forums, and there were developers just talking about stuff, and they said, need, need a marketing partner. And I looked into it, and I said, you know, I don't want to partner with you, but I'll, I'll make you an offer to buy it. Um, the second place is cold emailing, and that's how I got Hittail. I cold emailed the owner, and we negotiated a deal, and, and I acquired it. Uh, the third place is now Flippa. Flippa didn't exist when I was buying all these apps, but that's, that's really the place to go now. Flippa.com, you there is a ton of junk. 99.5% of it is is not worth buying. But if you monitor it and you learn how to read through Flippa listings, um, you can find something on there in a few months. It will take you a few months of probably 20 to 30 minutes a day of going through it. And that sounds like a ton of time, but trust me, it is so much less time than building than building that thing yourself. And then the fourth place um, is to go. There are some brokers who are reputable. Um, that's if you have a higher budget, you probably like 10 grand, between 10 and 100,000 bucks. And that's uh, Flipping Enterprises is one. And the other one is, uh, now let's see, Empire Flippers is the, are the, other, is the other one. Um, and then what to watch out for, or, or you're talking about what I, yeah, what do I look for? The thing that I have found the most success with is Ten, I bought some business to consumer apps as you see but business to business is always my favorite so I'd much rather go with a CMS themer or a .NET invoice which actually sells to other small businesses rather than a wedding toolbox or, or a beach towels consumers just tend to be more of a headache um, a lot of support they don't they're very price sensitive all that kind of stuff so I do favor B2B I also f I always favor recurring revenue these days although I believe that um, starting off, you can't be too picky, and you just need to get your get your feet wet and stair step yourself up. Um, in you know, back in, in when I was doing it, the way you did it is you did kind of a small niche site. You learned some SEO, and then you you stepped up and maybe did e-commerce, and then you stepped up and did software. These days, I think that day one, you should seriously consider doing like an add-on to an existing product. There's there's WordPress plugins. There's Drupal. Um, there's like Shopify, there's Magento, people build in, uh, integrations with Infusionsoft. All of those little tiny niches are B2B. You, you can find a B2B or at least a prosumer version. You can write like a single plugin. It's not recurring revenue, but I've seen many, many people now who are, who are getting one to two grand a month 
building in those little niches, then taking the knowledge they learn from there about email marketing and SEO and AdWords and all the stuff and parlaying it up and eventually doing SaaS, like a SaaS recurring model or, or some other recurring model. But, but that takes such a, it's such a long road to get there that I really recommend people don't, don't necessarily start out with it. Mm -hmm. Are we good? Yeah, last thing with the data invoice, obviously you see if they were maximizing everything and doing everything mm -hmm. perfectly, it's hard to you know buy it at a good price mm -hmm. and improve on it. What did you see that you could yes. you know, improve on? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. Uh, something I skipped over basically. When I was, uh, you know, so I don't I don't buy a lot of apps anymore. I'm at a point where I just have a bunch of them. But when I was buying apps, I really looked at an app that was built that I thought was in a niche market that had potential, but the app wasn't doing well and that I could see ways to optimize it. And so I could see that the, the funnel was bad, meaning the home page wasn't doing a good job of communicating the value, the pricing page sucked, the form, you know, the ask for people to register is too long, they're just not doing a good job of selling it, maybe not doing a good job of supporting it, they're not driving traffic. Um, and I would go, you know, on to look at, their, look at competitors, um, through SpyFu or through any of those, you know, MixRank and those types of tools and try to see where they were getting traffic from and try to look and gauge a, a size of this market, right? And Google AdWords keyword tool is helpful, although it's less helpful these days. But you can get an idea of like how many people are actually looking for this and can I get in the way of a couple of channels that these guys haven't already, um, you know, are, they haven't already taken advantage of and then can I make the funnel just a little bit better so that I can close more of the business because you can quickly double or triple revenue from an app if someone doesn't know what they're doing and it's completely unoptimized you can you can do that pretty fast surprisingly got it yeah that's right. good cool so learn faster um, the third the third lesson I think this one was you know around 2010 2010, and the lesson I learned is that it gets lonely when you're doing this stuff on your own, and that I think the value of of having other people around and having a community is super, super valuable. And so, while I am am a big proponent of single founders, and I've always been a solo founder, um, I started getting bored even though I had quit my job and achieved that goal. And so, at this point, you know, I'd already pivoted my blog to start talking about entrepreneurship and I built a small community and I got a lot of questions and so I wrote a book and the original intention was to sell three to six hundred copies just to pay for my time and as it turns out it it kind of sparked I don't want to sound cliche but it sparked kind of a movement of, of what I'm talking about this micropreneur movement of people starting self-funded startups anywhere in the world being location independent and uh, being able to do this on our own without raising funding and asking for people's permission. And later, I mean, the book became popular, and then I later turned it... Um, actually, no, you know what? I launched micropreneur.com, the membership website, before the book, but I later incorporated all the book content into uh, the membership website. And it did this to kind of gather us up. Like, there was no place that f everybody you know, who's doing this stuff was, was talking and I really wanted it to be uh, like an exclusive place where people who were serious about it would gather and micropreneur.com is a membership website so I wanted to charge money so that there was a cost of entrance and that it kept the quality high. And so, as I said, I wrote the book because I was getting a lot of questions and I just, you know, was looking for the next interesting thing to do. I didn't just want to acquire another app that made a few thousand bucks a month because that was getting old and the book seemed like a great challenge. Um, did it work out as I thought? It actually went way, way larger than I thought. And not only did it start gathering this community, as I said, but the, I originally planned to sell a few hundred copies of the book. Um, as of today, it sold well over 11,000 copies. It's a self-published book, and it's made you know hundreds of thousands of dollars for me, which I did not, I didn't set out to do. I was already making a full-time income from my app, so that was fantastic right and it was it took me putting myself out there and spending a lot of time to do it but um, definitely worth doing and then the membership site uh, micropreneur.com the hardest part about it which is something Jeremy wanted me to talk about is that getting it launched in the first place to be honest was the, was the hardest part it was getting momentum and once it had momentum and people were inside and there was a community there it's much easier for new people to come in and be part of that. But the fir those first months of getting 
even 50 or 100 people in there was just pain, painstaking, high touch, uh, you know, hand holding. Uh, and I don't mean that in a negative way. It was it was a ton of work though. Um, but now that now that it's up, we were able to you know I later launched a conference called MicroConf, and it's a conference for self-funded startups. And that comes right out of the academy. I mean, that basically the first 50, 60 you know attendees every year. Are, are sold to micropreneur.com members, and then the rest is sold to you know other self-funded startups. When you were starting to write the book, did you have in mind I'm going to create this online community and, and membership site with it, or would no. it just kind of come after? How'd that, no. how'd that happen? It came. At, to be honest, I put I put the cart before the horse, and I, I wished I had written the book first. But what I actually did was I had the blog, I had a community, and I said I'm going to launch. I want I really want a community, and so I'm going to launch a, a membership website because dead tree books are, are old hat, right? Nobody cares about them in, in our space anymore. So I launched micropreneur.com, and it did it did well. It did well enough to to justify my hours, but it didn't take off. There what I didn't quite have enough. Um, I don't know. I didn't quite have enough people. I didn't quite have enough engagement. Perhaps people could read a blog, but they weren't convinced that you know I should be running a community site. I mean, there were a number of reasons. So then I went back and I said, well, what's next for me? Micropreneur.com was going, and it had maybe 100, 150 people in it, but it was just kind of stagnating. And so then I went and wrote the book, and my goal with that was to be able to distribute to more people. You know, because Micropreneur.com is 50 bucks a month, and Start Small, Stay Small is. Nineteen dollars, you know, or I think Kindle version is ten bucks on Amazon, and so the goal for that was really to broaden the message and also just to experiment and to fail fast. I knew that I could, you know, put it together in maybe three months because it was all knowledge out of my head, and uh, it definitely exceeded those expectations. Yeah, I asked that about the hardest part of the membership site too, is because you know you talk about recurring revenue and mm -hmm. just selling, you know, a book or something like that. Obviously, the membership debt, you know fills that um, recurring revenue criteria. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to know kind of what with that membership site, um, what were big challenges? Like you said, customers, mm -hmm. what did you found work well with um, actually getting people? Because I think that's everyone's problem initially. They may have something valuable and getting people actually there is a huge issue. Right. Yeah, well if you're selling, if you, you know, if you're selling training like Micropreneur and, and the book are, I think you need a reputation. Like I believe that you should have a personal brand if you're going to sell information. And that has been the, the key way. And so all the people who came into micropreneur.com early on were from my blog or had read the book, frankly. And then later the you know I started a podcast and that feeds in and then microconf feeds into all that. But I think if you're selling software, you don't need a personal brand. I, I you know if you have a WordPress plugin, there are marketing approaches that um, work really well, and that's why. I mean, I'll talk in a, in a couple minutes about Hittail and Drip. I'm marketing that mostly without my my brand. Like, it's not my audience that's buying those. It is cold prospects. You know, people that I'm finding through traditional marketing approaches. Yeah, I like that because you know some people out there may have a certain skill set or an expertise, and they would go kind of more that route with a membership site, and you know they would need kind of that you know the brand and. I wanted you to point that out because you didn't just kind of launch a lumber site. You had a podcast. You had a blog. You started yeah. with a following and building up um, materials and expertise in the in that niche. Yep, that's that, and that's a good point. I think some people come on the scene and they say, "Oh, the only way to launch it is to have a personal brand." And other people say, "You don't need a personal brand. Just go after these marketing." And I think, it, like you said, it depends on your goal. And if you want to do the information stuff, I think it needs a personality behind it. Because people don't want to buy training courses, or at least I don't want to. Most people don't want to buy it from some big corporation. They want to buy it from a person they know, like, and trust. And that's that's achieved by making your brand. Yeah. All right. A um, couple, more, couple more lessons here. The next lesson I learned uh, is to parlay your skills. And this is this, really the story of Hittail.com. And the idea here is, like I already talked about, stair-step approach. I didn't try to, to start Hittail or to acquire Hittail from day one because I would have completely fumbled this ball. It's a SaaS app. Um, it's pretty hard to market. It took a lot of learning. It took me four or five months to rewrite it, mostly full-time. It took... Um, and, and redesign it and have, have all that stuff done. And then it took me about five months of mostly full-time marketing to figure out how to market. So unless you have 10 months of mostly full-time to take a, a risk like this, this is not something I would do on day one. 
But the lesson here is that I didn't do it on day one. I first built up other smaller businesses and I learned these marketing st these marketing steps like I learned SEO early on I learned ad AdWords early on uh, I, I learned dabbled in some paid acquisition that later came in handy I started learning content marketing uh, I learned how to do joint ventures and finding other lists and <clears throat> having people recommend you to their customer base while you do the same so all these things are tools in your tool belt you can't learn them all at once but if you learn them over the course of years and you have all that knowledge and you can then dump it into a larger idea like Hittail. And my goal for Hittail was to do a business that was about 10x what most of my other businesses were and it, it mostly reached, reached that goal. Um, the biggest lesson I learned while growing it is that you have to try a lot of different approaches. I put together a 12 page marketing document. It was just a bulleted list categorized by you know the, by the kind of the categories I've already named of like SEO, content marketing, joint ventures, press, that kind of stuff. And I just went through that from top to bottom and I tried everything. And the things that worked, the things that I thought had potential, I double and tripled down on. And I didn't look for the next sexy thing. If, if some really boring, grinded out paid acquisition was working, then I just dumped, dumped money into that and just figured out every way to, to take advantage of that and drive more people. And... Um, the other thing that I learned is that it, it always takes longer than you think. And you know, the four four or five months of revamping it and then five months of, of learning was much longer than I wanted it to be. During that time, Hitto was pretty much stagnant at a couple thousand dollars a month. And which is I bought it, it was doing about a grand a month, I think, fifteen hundred maybe in net profit. And then you know, it took me 10 months to get to about three or four grand um, because there was five months of revamp, five months of learning. And that's the other lesson is to be, to push and be impatient, but also be realistic. So one of the reasons, Rob, um, that I like that screenshot is because I wanted you to break down some of the elements because that didn't come together by accident. That's right. Yeah, if, you, if you're if you watching this and you go to old.hittail.com, you can see what the previous design looked like before I acquired it. And it's it's an older look and it's not very clean and there's a lot going on. And so what I wanted to do was redesign the homepage. I worked with a designer to do it. And I wanted a couple of key elements. One, I wanted a large headline that made a promise to you know whoever's reading it. And you, you can't help but read that headline. And if you want more search engine traffic, then you're at least intrigued enough to read the next line. And if you don't want search engine traffic, then you're going to leave, and that's okay because you shouldn't be using Hittail. You know, we actually don't want you as a customer at that point. Um, the other thing is I wanted a visual communication of basically the same thing. The headline communicates one thing, and the, the image supports it. And so I thought about how do you boil down an entire app into one single screenshot? And I spent a lot of time, hours, frankly, fiddling around with different pieces of it and came across, you know, eventually arrived at, at what you see there. The counter below it where it says 1.4 billion keywords analyzed, that is actually a dynamic JavaScript counter. I like the motion there because it's um, kind of draws your eye to the image, but it also, it, frankly, it's a, it's a bit of a van vanity metric, but it's a bragging point. Like, wow, these guys, wow, that, that's a lot of keywords, right? You have to take, uh, kind of take some attention when you see that. Um, it's credibility. You know, it's credibility, yep. And then along the bottom there is more credibility, right? It's social proof. For an app to get mentioned in Inc., The Wall Street Journal, Business Week, PC World, TechCrunch, CNET, something has to be going right, right? That just that doesn't happen by accident. And then, of course, there's a call to action right above that. Sign up for a free trial, which is the goal. Or, you know, if people are interested, you can. the secondary call to action is to take a tour. And so those elements, if you look at almost all of my sites across all of my apps, whether I'm selling training or whether I'm actually selling you know, software, pretty much the same formula I follow. And the last thing I'll say is the upper right, um, the top nav, I try to keep that as simple as possible. So I never have a blog or terms or about or any of that stuff up there. That all goes in the footer. I really want the core things people are asking themselves. A brand new visitor is going to ask themselves if they're going to consider using the app. Yeah, thanks for breaking that down. I think that was an important point to make. Very good. All right. So after Hittail, so I grew Hittail, and you know, instead of being in the single thousands, it was in the tens of thousands. And at that point, I kind of looked myself in the mirror and said, "What's next here? Like, what? So what do I do now?" And I realized that I wanted to go back to basics. And since I, you know, have 
a bit of flexibility. Um, I want. I was going to build another app because I don't need. I don't have such the time pressure anymore, right? Of of getting to profitability so quickly, and so I decided that. Um, well, I take that back. I was going to acquire, and I couldn't find anything. That I mean, I probably spent three or four months doing that. And during that period, I started questioning: Do I want to launch another app? Do I want to go back and revise a book, or you know, launch something else? And I realized that right under my nose, there was a pretty good uh, business idea. And what we had done is for Hittail, one of the marketing approaches that that we had implemented. And by this time, I have you know a guy who's working for me full time. Um, one of the approaches we had implemented was this email capture form, and you can see it here in the lower right, where it says capture more leads, convert more customers. That form we had implemented from scratch on Hittail, and we had installed it on every page of the site, and it was growing our email list pretty well. And so I realized that this could potentially be a business idea to actually um, give this form to other marketers, other SaaS owners, and software, you know. Uh, software companies, info marketers, have them install it on their site and really help them get onboarded with email sequences, um, helping them build autoresponders very quickly. The, now the thing that I didn't do was say, I'm customer number one and I have an itch and I'm going to scratch it and since they say scratch your own itch always works, I'm going to run off and build this because I call that the scratch your own itch fallacy. Scratching your own itch worked really well eight years ago. Um, especially in SaaS. It worked well seven, eight years ago when there was nobody doing this. But these days, most of the itches that you can scratch as a developer or designer have been scratched in one way or another. And so you have to figure out a differentiating factor. and You have to do something a little different. So what I did was try to figure out what can I do differently with this and what can I, how can I validate this idea beyond just saying, oh, I need it so other people probably do too. And so I went and emailed 17 founders that I know, colleagues, actually all of them aren't founders, they're just colleagues who I know would at least have some interest in this. And I got 11 of them to say yes and six of them to say no to this idea. And what it's now getdrip.com. And it's an email marketing app that is, as you see the you know little form here. And I, so then that, before until I got there, we had not written a line of code. Um, and the day that I got the 11th yes, I actually was trying to get 10, but I got 10 and 11 on the last day. And that's when I said, all right, developer, start writing code. And I put up a landing page at that point, And then I started driving traffic And because I, I wanted to continue to validate the idea during the development process. Yeah, I think that oftentimes, and I wanted you to point that out, that you, know, you validated the idea because a lot of times we think, oh, this is a great idea. I have this problem. A lot of people are going to have this problem. And you went out and you kind of got a consensus and... Um, email out the information before you just started building and spending all this time, energy, and money. So you know you would also have some customers when you first started um, building this. That's right. And I, you know, at the time I was gonna charge a hundred dollars a month. When I got to the end, uh, our, we charged fifty dollars a month. But with those eleven customers, I I figured that hey, in month one I'm gonna have at least five hundred bucks in recurring revenue. That's not a bad month one for a SaaS app. I mean, I know many, many that take several months to get there. So that alone would pay for hosting and some other stuff. And I just, it was not only validation, but it was kind of like, there, there's validation of the idea in a black and white sense of like, yes, it will work. But there's also this, this um, it's kind of like motivation. Like you need, I find that we as founders, if you're going to go spend 10 months building something, you need constant feedback or else you start losing interest, you start losing confidence. And that this type of feedback really helps with um, keeping you going. And there's a couple of things, you know, obviously, okay, let's say you email out and you go, oh yeah, I love it, I love it. How do you decide what to put out there as far as price goes? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. I originally pitched these guys via email with the price of $99. And the way that I was able to get there was to say, this will provide more a lot more value than that. And I knew that it would provide value because I, I already had it running on Hittail, and it was making us buckets of money. Um, and so I knew that if we could get everybody onboarded with this without them taking a lot of time to do it, that it was worth 99 bucks a month. In the end, as I got closer, and I, I by the time we got to launch, we had about 3,000, 3,500 people on an email list, and that's that's a whole other talk probably of how I how I got yeah. there, but. Um, I started running some surveys with those folks, and I knew that $99 was not a no-brainer price point, that $49 was. 
and with most people they were willing to try it if it was 49 and a lot of them were not willing to try it at 99 and so kind of in the last you know month or two uh, I put it to 49 and it, it there's no science to it really I mean it's it's really hard to split test pricing I know people who do but I wanted to start somewhere and get a customer base and at that time it was more important to get feedback than to maximize revenue um, with that said you know you could say well why didn't you drop it to 19 or 29 I've built businesses on on you know price points like that, and it's it's really hard to scale up. And I wanted this one to be bigger than hit to L and so um, I wanted to get to the point where I was providing at least forty nine dollars in value, and I could keep keep folks around and keep the churn rate low. Yeah. Did anyone use Get Drip in a surprising way that you didn't think of when you originally created it? Um. You know, to be honest, the original vision was just to have just to have that little pop-up form there and have it go on people's websites and then have them do a single course and maybe maybe a couple courses but right away people were saying well I want to send broadcast emails which wasn't surprising but it was like oh that's you know you need broadcast because people were leaving people were leaving their MailChimp and Aweber account to come use Drip so I mm -hmm. guess that was a little surprising I didn't really intend to build an email marketing tool as much as a conversion rate increasing tool and it has it has morphed more into I find that people I didn't realize people were as unhappy with the other providers as they are if that makes sense like yeah. I didn't think I would steal people away I wanted to kind of be an add-on and as it turns out it's probably easier to steal them away than it is to to build up an add-on so have you found people actually using it as a standalone yes. instead of just an add-on interesting that's exactly right and we've had to add features because of that but I also think it means well one will have lower should have lower churn rate Right, because it's like people don't want to cancel if it's standalone, because you know how painful it is to leave your email marketing provider. Mm -hmm. And two, I think that we ultimately we will be able to to raise prices because we just will provide more value. Great, awesome. So our last point here, uh, or my last point, I should say, is um, the other lesson I learned is how to juggle a lot of things. So if you go to uh, the Numa Group dot com, you'll see. Everything I think this mostly everything that uh, that is under my purview at this point, and there's I don't know maybe four software apps on the left, and then there are a bunch of you know training courses and books and conference and that kind of stuff on the right hand side. So I manage all these properties, and I do often get the question of how do you do this? And, and wife I'm, and kids, don't forget. Oh, and wife and kids. Actually, <laughs> we homeschool our oldest, and I do that to to. Uh, half days a week so I mean yeah I have, a lot, I have a lot going on I think the the three productivity hacks that I've used are number one I started outsourcing pretty early I started um, hire, I hired a virtual assistant back in 2007 as soon as I heard about the concept from the four-hour work week I went and dipped my toe in that water and being able to delegate and hi being able to find someone who's decent and then being able to delegate are both learned skills and you will not get it right the first time just like the first time you tried to build a big web app you had a lot of errors um, and you learned how to get better over time and just like you'll do it with marketing you'll have make mistakes and then get better same thing with delegating and outsourcing but I started early and by the time I've gotten here uh, you know I had a team of part-time people I had almost eight folks working for me at one point and that got a little little um, I'll say it was a lot of people and so I did, I kind of consolidated some stuff and let let a couple people go and I think I'm down to there's basically two full-timers plus me and then I have two other part-timers and so that's the first thing is I learned how to delegate and and to outsource so I don't handle tier one email support on any of my apps because it's just too time-consuming and you can train people to do that second productivity hack is I'm pretty guarded about my time so I I work when I sit down to work I work hard and I focus um, I don't have a lot of personal conversations hang out around the water cooler because I know that every hour or every minute that I'm doing that is a minute that I'm not either getting something done or at home with my family and I value my family time a lot so I say when you work be really focused and intense about it and when you're not working then don't think about work, don't do work, don't check your email, don't do any of that. Your brain needs time to relax. And so I try to have a pretty tough dichotomy between the two, and I try to get into that focus quickly, and so I do that using music and, and caffeine and stuff like that at proper amounts to try to get me into focus quickly so that once I sit down, when my butt hits that chair, I'm not sitting there surfing Hacker News. I'm 
queuing email really quickly, you know, or, or actually getting work done. And then I had a third productivity hack. Well, while you think of that, I had a yeah. question for you. Um, you know, you say that, and it's, um, you know, you want to be focused. And I find, like, for myself, someone, I'll be focused, and I'll, you know, be answering some, you know, essential email I need to answer, and they tell me, oh, will you check this, and then maybe that's on, uh, it's a YouTube link. I find mm -hmm. myself kind of wondering, do you use any tools mm -hmm. or software or, or timers to kind of keep yourself on track, even though you have the best of intentions? I, so I do, I don't, um, what I, I don't find myself wandering around YouTube much. I do that at night. Uh, I'm trying to think of why that is. I guess. Or maybe, I'm just, just thinking intensity. maybe as a mindset thing, like maybe, yeah. do you think I could be spending time with my kid right now if I spend this five minutes? It's so painful <laughs> to you. Or what, what, you know, yeah. what is that inside your head that gets you, you know, motivated just to, okay, stop looking on Facebook or whatever it is? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think I, you know, I like the Pomodoro technique, to be honest. Like, that could be, that timer can be helpful. I don't do it all the time, but I find that, so I naturally, I think all of us naturally go through these highs and lows of motivation, right, and focus. And so when I hit the lows, I really need to pull tools out of my hat. And that is, there's some specific mix, like playlists that I use, and I crank them up to 11, and I loop, I'll loop one song for eight hours. And I find that it gets you in a, a real, almost like a work trance, and it can send you into like a creative mode. So I'll do kind of funky things like that, or I'll go in and drink half a cup of coffee, and that'll help my mind focus. Um, or I'll do Pomodoro, like I said, where I'll do 25 minutes, and I have to just you bunker, hunker down, and I'll try to even f squeeze like a two-hour task that I think is going to take a couple hours into that 25 minutes and see if I can get it done, mm -hmm. and make it a competition with myself. Yeah. You know? So Pomodoro is just um, a timer that someone can get online that's free? Yeah, yeah. yeah. If you, I think if you get a Pomodoro timer yeah. in Google, there's like a bazillion of them, you know, yeah. or you can do it on your phone or whatever. It's just 25 minutes on, five minutes off is the yep. idea, five minutes stretching. Um, and so, yeah, that that is a good question, actually. The I'm not saying I never find myself wandering, but when I do, I really try to rein it in. And um, I actually have a Trello board, so I use Trello to manage stuff, where if, if someone sends me a link that I'm like, oh, I want to watch that later, you know, that uh, business to software talk or something on Hacker News or blah, 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 I either use the read later button, you know, uh, yeah. and go use Instapaper, or I will grab a URL and put it in this Trello board so that I know that I'm not going to lose it. And I can get the email out of out of Gmail so that I can get the inbox zero. And I have this list of, like, in your spare time Trello board. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's like non-work time so that I know that I capture those things and, and don't feel like they're sitting there cluttering up my, my view. Um, and then I the last, you know, the last productivity hack is... I try to never work on more pro on more than one project at a time. Even though I have a bunch of projects and a bunch of products, I only build one at a time because the building is what takes the time, the maintaining does not. So being able to focus on one thing, build it up, and then have someone like a virtual assistant or being able to write enough code to automate it that you can then step away and really just be in maintenance mode is perhaps the biggest productivity hack of all. And that's what's yeah. allowed me to, to grow this, this many things. At one point, I had more products than this. I had like 10 software products. And I basically sold almost all of my B2C ones because they are more, they're lower price point, less profit, and a little more of a headache than the others. Um, but at that point, I was still managing it, you know, really with just a VA or two. Um, yeah. I think that's my juggling. Any other questions on that? Love it. No, no, that was <laughs> right. good. Cool. So that's it. I'd love to hear questions that folks have. And as I said, you can get me certainly on, on Twitter after this at, uh, Ro at Rob Walling. Mm. And I have a podcast where I talk, you know, 30, 40 minutes every week. I'm basically talking about this stuff in real time. I mean, we have 160, 170 episodes. Uh, so startups to the rest of us .com, I, I recommend if, if you haven't already checked us out. Yeah. So we'll go to questions. I'm gonna look through Rob. Will you come back and you know? Yes. Go on, come back in. And uh, for anyone, you know, go to you can hit up Rob on Twitter. I've listened to many of his episodes. They're wonderful. And um, we're gonna go to some questions. So just ask any questions that you have in the chat, and we'll pull that up. I have a few written down that people were asking throughout that I'm gonna ask Rob. So um, anything that you could think of please ask because he's here. He's guarded time, uh, obviously, but he's he's here with us right now, so he's 
uh, ready to ask anything that uh, that you want. And the first question, um, Rob, that someone asked um, throughout was, what do you think? What skills are most important to for someone to run a business? Uh, um, it's a good question. I think that that marketing and being able to find a market and uh, communicate your value proposition. I include all of that in marketing. I think that is probably the number one skill. When I say that, a lot of software developers kind of gag and say, well, no, what about, you know, Apple or, you know, uh, Dyson, the vacuum guy. They don't do marketing. They just build a great product. I want to build a great product. And that, you know why? Because that's what we want to do. We all just want to build a great product and we don't want to market. Apple has engineered marketing to a science. They're so good at it that it's invisible. In fact, the best marketing is invisible. Um, Steve, Mar Steve uh, uh, Jobs keynotes that were amazing. We'd all watch them. Those were, if you watched what he did, they were very similar. They were more classy, but they were very similar to infomercial copy. He just wasn't as, he just knew how to do it without, deliver it, it without sand and scamming. Yeah, he sales. totally, yep, mm -hmm. it wasn't salesy, it wasn't high pressure, but it was the same stuff. Oh, one, and one more thing. You know, he'd do that, right? That's like, the, they totally do that. And he would present all the benefits and not the features. I mean, it's all the same rules. It's just how you present them. And so I think learning how to market and feel okay with yourself is totally cool. You don't have to market like crappy, you know, uh, there's some crappy info marketing and there's crappy info commercials and stuff. Don't be like that. You can be a good marketer. And, and still feel good about yourself. So I, I personally, I think that's the number one. I think number two is learning how to delegate. Like I said, I don't, I don't think I'd be where I, where I am if I hadn't done that. And uh, number three, well, obviously, if you're in software, you, need to, you don't need to know how to code, but it's nice to have some technical skill and be able to um, evaluate software developers. So another question on that note, which is the delegation. Someone asked, um, you know, as far as productivity goes, you mentioned you had VAs, and that was really important. What do you look for in a VA? Um, I look for, you know, it's funny. I started out by trying to evaluate people in the traditional uh, interview. You know, when you go to a corporation here you, in, in the States, you get this resume in the big interview and blah, blah, blah. You know, none of that matters when you're hiring a VA. What matters is if you give them a task, do they understand it and do they do it? So the first thing that I do typically is I try to whittle down the list. There are people that obviously aren't going to fit. And then I give them all the same task, and I see who did it best, and I hire one or two of them, because VAs are, tend not to be expensive. Um, and then one of them will typically last a few weeks, and that's the one I stick with. So I do it by, you know, what what do they get done? People Trial get by fire. Done. Yeah, and I could care less about your resume or what you've done. It doesn't matter if you can do the work that I need, you know? So yeah. I go into this, I actually have a course on this, a video course, uh, it's at startupvacourse.com, and it's like an hour of me talking about exactly my process, um, but that's that's the gist of it, is to yeah. trial by fire. Got it. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, and the, I'll take one last question. The last question, Rob, is thank you so much for your time, by the way. This has been super valuable, and um, let's see one second, um, is successful, you mentioned successful joint ventures. Mm -hmm. um, what was one that you could remember or two that you could remember that were especially helpful because that kind of launches your success and leverages someone yep. else's audience it really is so in general partnerships don't work in general and when I say partnerships I mean like a joint venture partnership where either you do an integration with someone else in order for you guys to both promote to your audiences or you just do a, a, an email promotion where they email their audience and say hey I like this tool and you do the same now you want to like the tool you want to be honest right but most of the time other people don't have enough of an audience to make it worth your while and they just want to waste a bunch of time the one the ones that have worked for me are with uh, people that already have hundreds of customers or thousands in it like an email list you know in terms of an audience and I do as well and we are we have a close alignment in terms of what our apps do so like with Hittail it's an SEO keyword tool somebody uh, Authority Labs I don't know if you've heard of them but they're like a rank tracker and they're really high end they're very nice and they work exceptionally I love the tool and so I cold emailed them explained who I was how many customers we had like right off the bat here's the credibility I'm not schmuck because I probably get two JV emails a week at Hittail and or Drip. I do nothing with almost any of them. I have a form reply my VA sends and it says how many, how big is your audience? Because that's really what we need to know, you know. And then if they have a decent audience, then I look to see if we're aligned. 
then I look to see if I like the tool, right? And so with Authority Labs, it was pretty successful for both of us. It was quite successful, actually. And they recommended it, you know, us to their audience, and we did to them. We didn't do any affiliate stuff. It was purely just a, hey, should go check these guys out, and it absolutely grew both of our businesses. Yeah, so if people are reaching out, I guess they should tell people your reach and then tell them how you're aligned as far as what you both can give each other. That's what you're trying to do. And try to build your credibility. Hey, we've been mentioned in Inc. Magazine, Wall Street Journal, XYZ, right? I mean, you may not have that, but what is your credibility? What are your testimonials? What are your... You have 500 paying customers. Like, any of that is credibility that, oh, well, you're obviously legit. If I hear that from someone, instantly I'm going to return their email. I'm going to have my VA pass it up to me. Yeah. Um, the last question is... Um, where people can find you. I know you mentioned this, but someone's asking, what's the name of your podcast? Yep. Uh, just mention it one more time before yep. we uh, end. The podcast is Startups for the Rest of Us. And you can find it in iTunes, certainly, and Stitcher and all those places. From there, you can you know, get me on Twitter, at Rob Walling. Um, check out my blog and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Rob, I want to be the first one to thank you. This is super valuable. Thank you so much for your time. It's always a pleasure. I had a great time. It was good talking to you again. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you.